Okay, well, thank you, everyone, um, and uh, for joining us today. We're here to talk about best practices for implementation of the USNS, the Universal Screeners for Number Sense. I'm Dave Woodward, founder and president of Forefront Education. I'm also the one who has led the development of the Universal Screeners and Number Sense and have been involved in the project since we first started writing these screeners um, back in the mid 2000s um, when I was working as an elementary math specialist for Boulder Valley School District. So some of them, some people out there might know um, these from way back then. Um, they got a very thorough revision in 2020 and then the rebranding as the USNS at that time. Today for our session, this session is gonna be recorded as you saw, and um, we will be able to send that out to everyone who's registered and you're welcome to share it with whomever you would like to. Um, we encourage you to put your questions in chat as they come up. Go ahead and load up that chat with all of your questions, thoughts, comments, etc. Um, we will stop occasionally to answer them. I'll kind of, Tamara and I will be monitoring those and, um, and then we might have kind of more an extended answering of the chat questions at the end um, because we have a lot to get through today. And so um, probably will not pause too much during the presentation, but mostly load those at the end. And um, so we're looking forward to, uh, to the whole conversation and want to make sure that it's as interactive as possible. Once again, I'm Dave Woodward, president of Forefront. I'm joined here today by Tamara Mack, who's our communications man manager. And, um, and thank you for being here, Tamara. I appreciate the support. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So I love, uh, I love starting with video and kind of getting some thoughts out there right away. So this is actually one time when we are going to ask you to put some stuff in chat. I want you to just think about what's happening here and what is he thinking. Um, this, this student's going to read a number of numerals, and um, and when you, he gets to that last one, um, think about what what he's thinking. All right, I'm going to have some credits for you. I'm checking on sound. Is everyone able to hear that? Camera. Uh oh. Yeah, I can hear it. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. And I would love for you to tell me what number is this? 628, 402, 555, 1000. Uh, Seventy five. Wait. Seventy five. I hope you all saw that numeral there. Actually, it is presented on the card as one over three, like a regular fraction would be written. So he's he's reading the number one third. So we know it's a different type of number, mm -hmm. and we've probably seen them before. I think we're using them in fractions. Fractions. Remember how we say that? One and one third. Right. All right. So, what do you think? What was he thinking there when he saw that numeral one third? Let's get it one more time right there. Right here. Uh. Wait. All right. What do you think he's thinking? Go ahead and put some ideas in chat if you would. We'll just take about 30 seconds here. And in this view, I am unable to see chat. Oh, there we go. Yeah, he's converting, he's trying to convert to a decimal, that's what I'm thinking also, he's trying to convert this thing to a decimal number in his head, somehow getting it confused, I think, right, I'd want to probe a little bit further, I think probably all of us would, to think about that. He did need a little bit of help, and, and that's one of these things about the screeners that I really, I love the fact that we're able to just do a little bit more probing um, with the kid to understand where they're at. She gives him a little bit of a, almost a, a helping question, if you will. 
have you seen these kind of numbers before? And he's like, fractions, you know, that's, um, you know, it just, it gets us, a, you know, we know that he's got that exposure. And then he ends up saying one and one third. Oh, three quarters. Thank you, Beth. That's a, that's a really good way of thinking about it. He saw that as one third, but thought three quarters. So we know that he's got some experience with fractions. We know that he needs to learn more, but we understand his starting point as a learner with fractions. And I think that that's the piece that I think okay. is so important. So we're here today to talk about um, implementing these screeners and, and, and in a district-wide or in a school-wide setting, um, how, do we, how do we implement them for a group of teachers? And I think it's really important to start with this question of your why. Why are you doing it? And I think showing a little video like that actually can be very, very helpful because it reveals even in just five or 10 seconds there so much about this child's thinking and what they do know. So you'll want to also communicate the plan. We're going to go through all this in detail. You want to think about planning for learning. And what I'm thinking about in this case is planning for the learning of your teachers. You need to recruit leaders. Who are your champions? We need to provide tools to the teachers to be able to get this done. And we need to make sure that we're using the information because if we don't immediately have that plan for using the information, people don't necessarily know the why and going back to that purpose at the very beginning of this as well. Reflect, refine, renew. It's an ongoing process. This is not something that just is done once and then you're finished. It's, it's a constant ongoing process to make sure that it goes well. So let's go through each of those ideas in some depth right now, knowing your whys. Why a universal screener at all? There's a lot of districts out there that are adopting universal screeners right now. Um, and, and, and many that have over the recent, like over the past five years, I'd say it's really taken um, hold. We've got people that are using iReady and, and NWEA and StarMath and all these other products that are out there that sell themselves as universal screeners. So why do you need a universal screener at all? What is the use for that? You need to know that. And then why the universal screeners for number sense? Why that on top of that, if you will, more specifically? And why now? What is it about our time right now that makes this important? What is it that, that, that's providing that opportunity for some kind of an adoption like this? Um, your why is probably unique to you and your schools and your, and your situation. So making sure that you're putting that within the context of your own schools and your own community. Personal testimonies from people in your district can help with that in terms of thinking about and communicating your why to others, making sure that you have that conversation, that those people who can provide those testimonies, the stories that go in there. And then I like to say that using points, if you're really trying to, or quotes rather, to make your point, leverage that external expertise can be really helpful. So going back to that first, um, that question of why having a universal screener at all, there's a nice um, document um, from Russell Gersten, actually, that was a huge inspiration for me. And he just said, you know, without universal screening, there is no RTI. That is your starting point. You need to know that every child has been screened in order to be able to start those RTI processes and, and have and establish that baseline and making sure that you're identifying the students that um, are going to need support, as well as identifying the areas of the curriculum where that support is needed. I love this quote from Marilyn Burns, and this gets to that second one about why the universal screeners for number sense. She says, it's all about my listening as a teacher, right? It's all about my listening that I learn that I have the possibility of being a better teacher. This is the, the universal screeners for number sense are as much about learning and understanding our students as they are about simply, you know, measuring where those students are relative to the expectations that are laid out there. Knowing that this is about learning, this is about understanding our students is super important. And this is kind of gets to that point of, of why the universal screeners um, in particular um, for number sense. So to our next point, I'm gonna go ahead and talk about recruiting leaders. Who are your go-to people, right? Having, having a person in each building is ideal, right? Somebody who they're, you know, that if, if you're implementing this and a second grade teacher has a question, who are they gonna go to to ask that question? If you have someone local, 
that they can just kind of walk down the hall and say, where do I find this? What is this? You know, how do I score this? Whatever that might be. It's, it's really having one in, in, in knowing who the leaders are. They, they need to know who the leaders are, right? So, so everyone needs to know who's leading this project and who is going to be able to be the helpful one. Leaders should try out and also model the assessments for others, right? So making sure that they know the assessments intimately themselves. They can then also provide testimonials about what they've learned from these assessments. Um, interestingly, I came from a conversation with a teacher earlier this morning, and she had gone through and, and given some, some of the tasks. She was just kind of using them diagnostically, if you will, with the student. And it immediately turned into this conversation about the, the behaviors of the students and those testimonials about how much she learned right away about that student and being able to support them in their learning journey. Supporting with the coordination is another thing that leaders can do, um, making sure that they're kind of helping, you know, put the pieces together. You know, this is not something that just kind of falls into place. Oftentimes, it does take a little bit of coordination, and they can also help with assessing. Sometimes people fall behind. Sometimes people just need a little bit more support to get through this, given especially new teachers a leg up in the process is really helpful. They're obviously there to answer questions, help to set that vision, and then they can also follow up, right, with the teachers. How's it going? We got another week left before the window is closing. How's it going? How can I help? What kind of support do you need, um, et cetera? Having the plan and communicating the plan are super important, right? You need to have the when, the who. You need to know what you're going to do with the data. You need to know what will happen next and when will the results be discussed and used. And once again, I like to take that back to the why at the very beginning, right? These is, we're going to use these results. They're not just for somebody else. These are for our teachers. This is for you. This is for us, right? This is for the whole system, the whole school, um, and making sure that that's really, really clear and communicating that from the beginning is very, very important. So for this question of the what, the when, the who, and the how, right? You have to have that plan for administration established, right? So that everyone knows what to expect and what the expectations are. And who is responsible for what? You know, if if you've got, you know, someone who's who's going to be responsible for making the photocopies, not always the case, but nice to have. If it's actually the teachers that are responsible for having the uh, the the copies made, well, then they need to know that too, right? Everyone needs to know who's responsible for what, right? In terms of the windows, right? That is the 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 win of the whole thing. I like to I like I like broad windows myself. Um, I, I don't like stress. I do like broad windows because um, when you have broader windows, then it then it gives everyone a little bit of flexibility, gives them the leeway. The fall assessments, as you might be aware, are entirely interview based, and so because they are. You know, it's it's going to take some time for people to get going. In the very first days of school, they're probably not going to be doing any assessment at all. It's important to recognize that. I like to put in approximately as many days into the window as there are kids in your classes. So that is, you could tell the teachers then, you've got 25 kids. The window closes on such and such a date. You could do one a day, or you have three days when you're going to need to do two. But you can just try to, can you do one a day is kind of the question that I, that I ask people. And they're like, yeah, okay, I could figure out how to do one a day. Awesome. Well, then I'll help you with the other three. Let's do it that way. And then that way, then you really can get those teachers involved in the whole thing. I think it didn't emphasize as much as possible here, the idea of the who, and I'm going to come back to that in another slide, because I really want the teachers giving these assessments. Because remember, it is about their learning that we are doing the assessments in the first place. It's about them understanding the students that are in their classes. Uh, that mid-year assessment, I like to, once again, a very broad window. That that mid-year assessment has three parts to it in most of the grades. And so, therefore, you can break it into those three parts, do your interviews kind of throughout the entire window, and then have that time when you do the, um, the two different parts of the written assessment. There used to be a digital component that's now phased out for the time being. But that that written component is still there, and then you can have the written component with the digital component, which are are now both assessed um, paper and pencil. But it's 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 not bad to break those into two separate sections, um, so that they become bite sized, right? And then um, the spring one, April first to the end of the year is what I've put here. Kind of depends on your own um, calendar. I like to have at least a few weeks at the end of the year 
before the, at that, after the window closes. So that gives uh, for a variety of reasons. First of all, it gives the teachers a little bit more flexibility if somebody happens to run over a little bit, right? And then it also, um, you know, knowing that there's so much going on those last couple of weeks of school, it doesn't make any sense for people to be rushing through assessments at the end of the school year. It stresses people out. It doesn't make any sense. And then perhaps most importantly, having a few weeks at the end of the year also allows for for the teachers to respond instructionally. There's a few things that might need to get cleaned up here and there. Obviously, you can't clean everything up, but you might be able to provide some initials, you know, some kind of reteaching of, of ideas or, or a little bit more of small group instruction for kids to be able to, you know, go it out at the end of the year successful as they can be. Those spring results also, I'll, I'll put this out there right now because I don't think I mentioned it oftentimes are um, what drives a lot of the planning for the summer school sessions and can be used to decide which kids might get into those programs and what kinds of instruction might happen in those summer school programs. David, we have a question before we move on to the next yeah. slide um, related to that mid-year assessment window. How many days would you recommend um, allocating for the mid-year and the end-of-year assessments? So the mid-year, you know, if, I, if we're talking early November to the late January, you've got about six weeks there, um, uh, considering that you probably have got two weeks for the, the um, um, Christmas break, the winter break there, right? And then um, the end of the year, April 1st, I honestly, I was thinking when I, when I wrote April 1st, I was thinking that your school year probably is ending at the end of May. Um, cause that's what we do around here in Colorado. I know that there's a lot of districts out of East that kind of go to the first couple weeks of June. So, so you might want to go a little bit later on that, but I think it's probably going to be around 20, 30 days. The, those, the spring, the spring and the mid-year um, interview sections are shorter. Um, and so that, you know, that those, they're still going to take about five minutes because the, the, the problems are a little richer, they're a little deeper. So still trying to aim for about those 30 days, if you can, 25 days. But, but if, it, if it needs to be a little shorter, generally um, I've found my experience in working with teachers is that they seem to have, you know, the beginning of the year is hard because there's so much going on. By the middle of the year, it's easier to be able to sit down and get two or three done kind of back to back. Um, so there can be a little bit, um, uh, a little bit more crunched, if you will, um, for those mid-year and spring ones, um, rather than give me the full 30 days. I hope that helps. Yeah, I would go. You. I would go with longer than ten to fifteen, though, if you can. If you can get, if you can get twenty, twenty to twenty-five, maybe. Um, once again, it's it's one of those things, um, and I talk about this a lot. Meaningful and manageable. I, I think that the, the the universal screeners by themselves are are very meaningful assessments. Keeping it manageable is super important. So so kind of you know feel that out with your teachers. You know your teachers better than I do. So who should conduct the interview assessments? Classroom teachers with support. So what I mean by that with support is that maybe, you know, I mean, and, and as, you know, there's these are different ideas. And once again, it's all related to your context. I've heard of people giving substitute teachers, maybe, you know, having a roving substitute teacher so that a teacher can get an hour to get through and plow through, you know, a half dozen to a dozen assessments in, in one sitting and just kind of getting those knocked out. Um, so if, if that's a possibility, I know that that's not a possibility for everyone. That's one thing that I've has heard that's worked. Um, some schools have an assessment day. So sometimes, usually, these are built around literacy. Sometimes, if you could just schedule in an extra five minutes, you can get your screener done, or at least a good chunk of that screener done at the same time. Um, collaborative groupings, that is, hey, what if we got all of our first graders, we got three first grade classrooms, what if we're able to bring all of our first grade classrooms together, we'll have two teachers kind of managing, you know, centers type games and other things going on, and give one teacher an opportunity to do a ton of assessments, and then we'll rotate that so that we can get um, that done, right? Or paraeducator support is another way to do this. So thinking about, hey, can you know, can we get a paraeducator in there so that we can run centers while the teacher is able to pull those out? And then the para does the classroom management and kind of the supportive work that needs to be done so that the teacher can get that focus time with a student to do those interviews. Um, that same model can work with your coaches or, um, or other people that you have in the schools to support them. I've done it before where I've said, hey, listen, I'm gonna come in and teach your class for the day as an instructional coach. That gives me a chance to get to know the students. It gives me a chance to really kind of, kind of teach for a little bit and run some centers if I wanna do that. 
but then it also gives the the classroom teacher the time to do the 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 assessments that um, that she needs to get done in order to um, to get that you know the information that we need. Okay. How many can the teacher do, and what is manageable? Choose. So so sometimes you know it has it has happened right that sometimes teachers are like, listen, I can't. I'm not going to get through all of these things. Well, how many can you do is the question that I like to ask at that point in time. Okay, I could do a dozen. Awesome. Okay. So if you're going to have an interventionist or a coach do some of the assessments for that teacher, right, then who, who cho choosing which students the teacher does and which students that the, the, the interventionist would do is kind of the question at that point in time. I like to choose students for the teacher who are new to the school because we don't have information about them. Right. So get that information into the hands of the teacher who's working most directly with them. The kids who are kind of in the middle are, are another one to hand out, because oftentimes the kids who are who are at the top. Right. Are going to um, are, are going to be, you know, interesting as well, that is. And then um, uh, you can hand off those students then to the to the interventionist or whoever to who are really likely to ace it. Right. And then um, also then to hand off to the uh, to the interventionist, if you know that that interventionist is going to be working with that student continually and has worked with that student in the past, that might be a good a good option as well, um, just because they need to get that information also. Right. And then they can share that information back to the teacher and collaborate around that. So so those kids who are on the the top and the bottom are the ones that I kind of hand off sometimes. Although, like I said, sometimes those kids who are likely to ace it don't ace it. Um, and and like that kid that was in the video that we watched, he really did very well on this assessment in general. That little bit about the one third, I would want to know that as a teacher, what he did there. I would really, I mean, first of all, to capitalize on the fact that he's already got this idea that decimals and fractions are similar, that he's seen fractions before, but doesn't yet know how to read them. And I mean, that's a lot of information from a very, very short piece, piece of, of, uh, of, an, of an interview there that will be very helpful for me instructionally when we come back to fractions in unit three or whatever it's going to be. So once again, coming back to the same question, who's learning? The teachers are, right? This is all about, this is all about the rich information that comes from listening to talking with and observing students. That's what provides insights into how students learn and to what our students know. And I don't think I've got a thing about it, but I, I, wanna, I wanna just emphasize here right now how important it is to talk about asset-based uh, assessment. That is when I talk about asset-based assessment, what I'm thinking is we're finding out what the student knows. There are too many assessment systems out there right now that will tell you what a child does not know. And we learn nothing about what they do know. The screeners are designed to help us understand what students do know and also then their next steps for learning. So, so knowing what a child knows. And so, so if you've got that assessment that comes through and it's all straight ones, that is the child was not successful at all, then it's time to do more assessment. You did find out a lot about what that kid doesn't know. It's fine. It's time then to follow up with more assessment at that point in time. You do need to make sure that you're really focusing on what the child knows so that then the teacher knows what the kid does know, and then they can build from there. So in terms of, of this implementation, once again, you got to provide all the information. There's a lot that people need to know where they're going to find the materials that they need. Who's going to lead that effort? Who's going to answer the questions? Can you do this during new educator or orientation? If this is, especially if you're in your second or third year of an implementation, really the time that you need to focus on the new training then is during your new educator orientation when you bring in those new teachers in. I know it's hard to get time during those things, and I know that there is just way too much for teachers to learn, but giving them 20, 30, 40 minutes to watch a video, score a video, talk about it together, talk about those whys, why are we doing this, watch a video together. It's just, that's a, that's a great opportunity to get people all the information that they need. 
And where are they going to put the results? Is it going to go into a system like Forefront or, or where is it going to go? And so making sure that you know where that data is going to go and how and when will you use the results is then the other question that I kind of come back to another, another, a number of times here and, and, we'll, and we'll continue to hammer on. Um, so in that question of where are you going to put the data, you have to plan for that data collection and usage, right? It needs to be meaningful and it needs to be manageable and it needs to be accessible and secure, right? So, so if, if here, here's, I'm just going to go to kind of a worst case scenario, you have to put your data into the student assessment, student information system, because um, the curriculum director wants it. That, that's not, it's neither meaningful and having worked with a number of SISs, I will tell you that that's oftentimes not manageable either. It's not easy to do that. And, and just teachers get frustrated by it because it's essentially a waste of time for them. They don't, that, that data then once it's locked in that SIS is barely accessible. It's secure. It's so secure. You can't even get to it. It's, it's, but it's, it, you have to have an idea of where that data is going to be going. And, and um, so make sure that you think about that in the, in the very beginning. Okay, what's next? Also communicating with families, right? Responding instructionally, meeting to discuss the results, right? Um, so, so making sure in, in terms of this, this piece right here, what is it that you're gonna to wanna to communi with, communicate with families? And I would really encourage you as leaders to think about that in terms of thinking, okay, how do we provide the information so that our teachers don't have to try to wing it? You know, and figure it out on their own. If you can really supply them with a solution, that means that you're going to get high quality, consistent information to the families about what happened, right? Um, and then, and then this idea of the meetings to respond instructionally and to meet and discuss the results. Okay, planning for learning. Get your teachers up to speed, right? So, so at the very beginning, you got to get your teachers up to speed. They have to understand how to give these assessments. You have to provide them time to learn many teachers will have never ever seen these assessments before so you've established your why you know they they get it they know why they're doing it maybe they watched a brief video about how these things work we've talked about you know understanding and, and the importance of number sense etc right so at least you need to give your teachers a time to read through the assessments discuss them and ask questions that's at the at the very very least right they need to have a chance to look at the materials think about it, right? Kind of do some preparation and talk about it with their colleagues. Better yet, provide time to watch some videos that then you can that model the administration of the assessment and then they can discuss those videos and the scoring of them. And then they can compare the scoring with one another. So that's really the ideal, right? That can, and this can take you know, anywhere, depends on, depending on how much time you have and how much time you're willing to give to the thing, I'd suggest that really two hours is certainly enough. One hour is very doable um, for, for getting people up to speed on this thing. Um, but but it's, just, it's just, you know, giving some time to, to actually take the, you know, that shows the importance of it as well. Um, and just to make sure that you understand, we at Forefront, do provide in-person or virtual professional development to do exactly that. Um, and we can do that, you know, if it's in-person, we'll want to probably do a little bit more time just because it provides us those opportunities to have really rich conversations, or we can do it virtually with you. Um, and you can find out more about that on our website. We do have a, a click on the learning link and you will find out more about that. And I think we have a link later in the, in the thing as well. So what do people need to know? They need to know how to administrate, administer the assessments. They need to know how to score those assessments. They need to know where they're going to collect the results. And still, there will be questions. So, so making sure that you're ready to you know, provide this kind of learning opportunity for people. And, and there will be questions. So that's one of those things about, yeah, make sure that you've given these assessments before you actually try to do the training yourself or hire us in and we will help you with that. So um, some general general tips, and, and if there's any questions, we're kind of transitioning to a new section of the thing right now. Um, so make sure that you get those questions into the chat so that we can get back to them. I know that I'm going through this quickly, um, and, and, and uh, so, so make sure that you stop me when you need to.
I do want to just um, share here. We did have one question. I, I did answer it through chat, but I did want to put the answer out live for everyone. Um, we do have a, a montage of videos, including the one that you saw today um, on our USNS project page. The total vid video is about eight minutes, but the, the first five minutes include little excerpts from K through five interviews. Yeah, that's actually, yeah, it's a nice way to get to, well, you can, you know, first of all, it's kind of gets at that why, right? And you can have a conversation about why at that one. And it also gives you kind of an, a good, a good kind of overview about the administration of it. Um, so yeah, that's, thank you, Tamara, for pointing that out. So in, in some, just some general tips for the administration of the assessments themselves, right? So the giving of the assessments. And this is something that I would share with the teachers during a training um, when you're doing them, you want to aim for at the lower grades, five minutes or less on those fall assessments. And that should be true of the interviews throughout the entire assessment. Fourth grade mid-year gets a little long, I'll, I'll admit, um, but there's a lot to find out in fourth grade mid-year. So at the upper grades, it does get a little bit longer. Once again, the, as, the, as the questions get more complex, they take a little bit more time. I, I have been through many kindergarten assessments in two and three minutes. Whipping through them, seldom do they last more than five minutes for me. Um, at the upper grades, I've given a lot of those assessments in five and six minutes, but I've done others that really do, as I give enough think time, take 10 minutes, even 11. So recognizing that those upper grades are going to take a little bit more time and, and, and all that, but don't attempt to get too diagnostic during the screening process. And what I mean by that is um, teachers will oftentimes want to ask a lot of questions. And I'm going to just put it out there that if they've been trained in Advantage Math, which is a fantastic training, and I would absolutely encourage everyone to do Advantage Math training, um, if they if they have gone through that 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 program is is quite diagnostic in the way that those assessments are done, and so teachers have been trained to do more diagnostic assessment, and they will try to turn the screener into a diagnostic, to try to get all that rich information all at the same time. And then what happens is that the teachers turn around and say, "I'm not able to get through this thing. I just spent 15 minutes interviewing that first grade student." Well, 15 minutes is entirely too long. You might need to do a 15-minute assessment with that child to really understand them and their thinking and to find what they know. I absolutely understand that that's the case. But as we're screening, go through, ask a couple questions, get the information that you need to get that score, and then realize, okay, I might need to go back at another time to go do some more diagnostic, or I might need to get some more help with that diagnostic assessment, which is another possibility in this case. So when teachers start to ask too many questions and really try to go in depth, and honestly, that's because they have the best intentions and they really do want to understand the students. And I think that that's something to recognize, but for the screening part of it, it needs to be efficient. So try not to go too deep with your questioning, right? Just enough to get that reliable score. Consider breaking the assessment up into parts. Um, I, I was talking a little bit earlier about maybe you could plug it into your assessment days. You got at that literacy assessment time when, you, when you're working with students and you're talking with them, they've canceled school for the day, you're bringing in kids on a schedule and you've got an extra three minutes. Okay, you're not going to get able to get through the entire assessment, but maybe you could do the counting tasks and the numeral ID tasks. Just do that. You've got a chunk of it done and then you can come back to the rest of it later. Another thing that I like to suggest people to, um, that people might want to do, and, and this works really, really well with Forefront, which we're not gonna be demoing today. I hope that you're not here for a Forefront demo. If you are, then, um, then sign up for a demo. We'd be happy to show it to you. But, but one thing that you could do on there is just kind of say, hey, you know, I'm just gonna do the counting tasks as an independent thing. And then another time when I need a table to set up materials, I'll sit down at a table with materials, but I can get through the counting tasks while the kids are working in centers. I'll just pull the kid aside. Let me hear you count. Let me hear you count. Let me hear you count. Right. Or I might even be able to do this while they're standing outside the, the PE, 
right? They're standing outside the gym. They're waiting for Jim. I'm just going to pull a kid off to just a little bit off to the side. Let me hear you count. I've got my iPad right there, or I've got my clipboard right there, and I can get that task done right there. So being flexible, breaking the assessment up into parts kind of makes it a little bit more bite-sized um, for the teachers to be able to work with, and that's just fine. You can do that. That's fine. Um, schedule in advance and helping your teachers to plan on that, especially your new teachers, right? Because they are struggling with everything. <laughs> They're new teachers, right? So saying, hey, you know, when are you going to get this done? Let's think about this. What time of day can you get this done? Let's plan this out. Let's think about how we're going to get five done this week. Let's think about how we're going to get, you know, five done, you know, over the next three days because the window is closing whatever it might be, just helping teachers to kind of manage that piece of the planning and thinking about when they can schedule time to get that done, okay? Um, just another tip for administration, if you will, consider video, videotaping yourself um, some of the videos, and then you can discuss those in your PLC and other professional learning opportunities, right? Um, so uh, that's another another thing just kind of to put in there as a note. Um, if you can, I don't suggest videotaping everything. Nobody's got time to watch all those videos, right? So so just, you know, watching, watching one or two, though, um, can be a really fantastic um, learning experience for everyone. Um, so not a full demo, but just a little bit about Forefront here. Uh, and I was talking about just doing those counting tasks. Here you can see in Forefront, we do have this interview tool. Right. So I can kind of say, hey, let me let me hear you count to 10. And then I can just mark that right on my iPad or on my laptop or whatever you're using for your device to collect that information and then hop from kid to kid to kid. You don't see that there's a little drop down there to be able to move from kid to kid on this on this image right here. But that's definitely there. And then those numeral ID cards, you can just keep those in your pocket, whip them out there. Let me hear you read this one. Let me hear you read this one and then collect that data at the same time. So just so you know that the the having that interview tool is, is a great way to make that that data collection meaningful and manageable once again. And if you're curious, the little green plus button off there to the right is where you can enter your notes for that as well. So providing resources, at least teachers need easy access to all the documents. Better yet, have the materials prepared for the teachers if that's possible, right? Um, or or some somewhere in between is also a possibility. Have them get, you know, you got the original paper copy. They're going to have to make the the photocopy of the of the uh, um, data collection tools if they'd like that. But um, that's uh, just that piece there. And if you're hearing my dog barking, that is because someone just rang the doorbell and I'm going to ignore them. So use the information. So um, just one sec. Sorry about that. So possible uses for the information. Next steps for instruction. So um, those of you who are using Forefront or who are planning to use Forefront or perhaps even curious about Forefront, we do provide some next steps for instruction directly through the interface there. Um, but thinking about thinking about what is it, how will you respond quickly to the results? You found, let's say that you're a kindergarten teacher, you just found that you've got three students who are still, you know, have come into your class in the fall and are unable to um, count to 10. What are your next steps for those students right away? Whole group and small group instruction is another way to respond quickly um, to things. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to hush her, sorry. Well, we have this unruly dog here. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to drop them into the Q&A tool. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about that. She's calmed down now, okay. <laughs> All right, um, this idea of pre-teaching I think is super important and it really at the upper grades is where it's even more important, I think. Um, I'm gonna go back to that video we watched earlier. Like I, I was kind of alluding to earlier, I said, you know, fractions might be coming up in unit three of fourth grade. And here you got this kid, he's seen fractions before, he doesn't really know what's going on. Maybe a little bit of pre-teaching because reading one third, remember, is, is something that we expected him to be able to do in third grade. Maybe they didn't get to it. Maybe we had a pandemic, right? So so it's, it's you know, this idea of, hey, what do we, maybe in, in our warm-ups and in our small group instruction, perhaps, 
we can give those kids that need it a little bit of a leg up so that they're going to be able to have access to that instruction of the unit when it comes at them. And so, so taking the results of your screeners to make sure that you're front loading, I like to call this teaching forward, right? To make sure that those students are ready for the instruction that's coming before it comes. Identify students for further assessment. As I said earlier, we're really looking after what they do know. So if you go through an assessment and you find a lot about what they don't know, you might wanna do some more assessment to try to figure out what they do know. That's very, very important. Um, and then this idea of family communication and um, uh, I'm plugging Forefront one more time right here. If, you, if you're using the software, um, once your results are in there, you can click one button and it will produce a series of documents for your entire class that are customized for each of your students to be able to communicate to the parents those areas where the child was successful, those areas where, where we need some little bit more support, and then it gives a few little tips to the parents to say, hey, try this, you know, when you're at home, you know, Try making sure that you're you're talking about equal, equal groups, uh, things like this, right? So quick little tips for the families to help them understand what the assessment was about, how their child performed, and how they can support the learning at home. Um, and then um, understanding instructional strengths for, and areas for growth is obviously another um, use of the information. So this is more of a systematic and a school-wide thing. Um, one of the things that really can be very, very interesting when you're looking at your results over, um, you know, across multiple classrooms and across multiple schools in some cases is that you recognize, holy smokes, you know, year over year here, we're having troubles with this idea right here. This is probably something that's not necessarily a strength of the program. What maybe supplemental things might we want to put into place? What professional development, what, what might we want to put, put into place? And what kinds of goals might we want to put into place to ensure that we're really focusing on and supporting instruction in those areas? And then I like to point out resource allocation. One of the things that we discovered when I was working in Boulder was we found out that we had about 45 students one year who coming into kindergarten were unable to count to 45 or un un unable to count to 10. So right at the beginning of the year, we know that we've got this group of students who, who are not really ready for kindergarten, let's face it, right? Because they can't count to 10 yet. Everyone else in the entire district, we got 2000 students that can count to 10, we've got 45 that can't. We found out also that those students were concentrated in three schools. You know, they were most of them in three schools. If I were a leader, right, and had that resource allocation in my hands, I would be thinking very, very quickly, what can we do to put those resources where they are needed? Other situations might be in a school where you find that you've got a concentration of need in a certain grade level and a certain group of students. Let's just say that we had a pandemic and, and these kids came through first grade and they really didn't get a great first grade education. Now they're in third grade or fourth grade and we're finding out that we've got some things that didn't get learned very well with those fourth graders. Could we kind of flood in there quickly to make sure that we catch up some of those things that didn't that didn't get supported in the earlier grades so that we can bring those kids up to speed so that they're ready for the, the instruction that's going to be happening? So think about whether you could take your information from the screeners to really concentrate and really be very strategic in your use of, of resource allocation. There's a couple of questions about this slide, David, if we could stay yeah. here for a minute. Um, sure. So there were two related to the bullet number four. Uh, the first question from Carla Griffin is, would, would these screeners be appropriate for determining which students need tier two intervention? Yes. I mean, I think so. Yeah, I mean, I uh, tier two, yes, absolutely. Because then you're, you're able to, to, so what I like to say is this though, right? I like to look at the results of the assessment and look at the results in terms of what are the questions where students were struggling and then say, okay, I've got, let's just say I've got um, half my class struggling with a, a fraction task. Okay, that's probably a tier one type thing. We need to think about how can we get the teacher to support everyone in getting up to speed with the fractions. And then on another uh, task, let's say that I've got four kids that are struggling with numeral ID. Now let's focus in on numeral ID with those four students. 
so that could be thought of as a tier two thing. Now, what I've seen happen sometimes is that I've got a child that overall performs quite well on the assessment, but only has very specific needs in one specific or two specific areas. So, so I'm not identifying the student in that way because look, they did pretty well. They, you know, in, in terms of their overall, as we call it, they are, you know, showing that they're proficient, but they still have some specific needs. So I think, I think of fo focusing in on the topics first and then thinking about the students and making sure that all students get the support in the areas where they need the support. Okay, so yes, if you, you, you will find and Forefront um, will provide you with um, your uh, percentiles, right? So that you can see the percentiles of the larger, you know, peer group across the country and across the world of students who are taking these assessments. And you can say, okay, this child is, you know, they're performing in the, the bottom 10th percentile, let's say. Yeah, we need to we need to think about them not only for further assessment, but for, for some immediate instruction in terms of tier two, right? So think about those identifying those needs of the whole class and then also the students within that. I hope that was good. Awesome. Cameron, you said there was another one. Yeah, thank you. So again, related to that same one is um, identifying students for further assessment. What what are you referring to in terms of these assessments? Are you suggesting doing the screeners from previous grade levels? Yes, that's a good yes. That's a yes. There's probably a number of yeses in a row there. Um, so yeah, I, I think if you if you drop back and do a screener from a prior grade level, it's a great place to find out what that child knows. It's a really easy way to do it, and it's a very quick way to do it. You'll find on the fall assessments that those are directly referred to some advantage math assessments that's um, from the Math Recovery Council. Um, so I've already talked about them once or twice, but but the math recovery training, that's a full on training. I've heard of other people going to Kathy Richardson as an assessment. She's, she put out a series of books that were really popular about 10 years ago, um, but are still excellent. Um, and I would I would suggest that Kathy Richardson is another another good follow up kind of diagnostic assessment that you can do with students. So all of these things are are good ideas for further assessments um, for the students. And uh, um, you know, and and in the hands of a really capable um, interventionist or someone who really knows what they're doing, um, you know, they don't they can they can kind of do that that diagnostic assessment and kind of dig for those starting points without having to you know, just on their own kind of freelancing it, if you will, just uh, free form. So that's another opportunity as well. I mean, I'd want to go to something that's going to get more detailed about finding out what the student does know, right? Once again, I'm not thinking about putting them into an Ames web progress monitoring thing. Uh, you know, that's going to give us a number. Uh, it's not going to give us information really. Um, I, I'm you know, and the other computerized assessments that kind of come to mind also, same kind of thing. I don't think of those kinds of things as being the follow-up assessments. I want something that's gonna be really giving me detailed information about what the child knows. All right, are we ready? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, collaborative work, um, common understandings, common goals, transparency. So, so when we're thinking about that, that collaborative work after you've got your screener data done and, and as you're moving this thing out, thinking about how you're going to build common understandings, common goals, keeping everything transparent um, and common understandings, uh, and then the shared information, right? And that communal action, that kind of gets back to that data tool, making sure that the information is accessible to everybody who, who has, who needs it, right? And it should be it should be the center. I I think for at least a one meeting, you want to just have one meeting where you bring everyone together to make sure that you're focusing in on your screeners, and and I like to talk about communal action in sort of like this way, right? Let's just say that I've I've gone through my screeners and I find out that I've got four students who are still working on counting through the teen numbers in my class. Well, there might be two other students in another class and one in the other class. And then it turns the conversation from what am I going to do with these students to what can we do with these students, right? And then when you can really, you know, because there's going to be common challenges across classrooms as well. And having those, you know, talking about those common challenges and the collective challenges that people have is really, really important. This can be just a grade level thing. It can also be a school-wide conversation. 
Um, yeah, it needs to. So this, I just feel this is just kind of a pedagogy thing. You know, the information needs to have visible aspect um, impacts on instruction, intervention, planning, etc. If 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 the information that you're collecting from your assessments is not impacting instruction, your planning, and improving things, then then maybe that. I mean, then what's the purpose of the assessment? I guess is the question, right? So I think that you know. Um, one one of the question that I got years ago is talking with some teachers and you know they were doing a a little research study on the the screeners themselves and they wrote me an email and they said are they formative assessments and I said well, I don't know you tell me you're the ones that are using these assessments if you're not using these assessments to provide high quality feedback to your students then they're not formative if you're not using the information from the screeners to impact your planning and your instruction, then they're not formative assessments. If you're not using them to, to decide who's going to get additional supports and in what areas they're going to get additional supports, then they're not formative assessments. The formative assessment process is a process that the teachers do themselves. It is not a quality of the assessment itself. It's a quality of what's done with the assessment. So... I just think that that's a really important um, basic reports in forefront. Once again, here you can see that I've got my Stewart Elementary relative to my district um, so that I can kind of get perspective on my performance. You can drill in on all of this stuff. You can click on the numbers to see the, uh, the different um, tasks and exactly which tasks they were and your relative performance. You can also add in the global on this and see, you know, like that, that, percentile relative to kids everywhere who are taking the assessments. So just another, another view of making that information relevant, making the information visible, accessible, meaningful, actionable is, is really key in the whole process. And then I like to just say, reflect, refine, renew. Just continue this process over and over again. How did it go this year? What could be better? How can we do better next year? What are we going to do in between now and next year? What can we do now be between fall and mid-year to make this process go more smoothly and to, and to be more meaningful and more manageable? Reflect on your successes. Reflect on the challenges. Reflect on the next steps. Set goals. Look for trends in your data over time. Having a good data tool to do that is important for that to be really meaningful, for it to be really school improvement data that's going to carry you forward. I love this one. This is one of these things that I uh, collected years ago. You can see um, this is out of forefront. I've got on the, on the right, you can see I've got a breakdown of males and females. Um, and this is the kindergarten fall assessment. And we saw that at kindergarten, our girls and our boys were performing absolutely that at the same level. But then as they grew over time, suddenly there was a separation. It was a great conversation starter for everyone, for us to think about. What was particularly interesting about this is that we saw this at a district level, but we didn't see it at a school by school level. Things were different from one school to another. So really, really interesting stuff. So thinking about you know, how are you going to use your data to really reflect on instruction and your systems that you have in place? There we go. With three minutes to spare. Questions? Okay, I'm going to... Have you worked with anyone successful? Uh, I don't know what you mean quite with that Salesforce from the from the screeners. Salesforce has a product, Salesforce for educators. Um, I I'm not familiar with the product, and no, we have not. So, yeah. I think that the the thing to point out there with the distinction too is that when you use Forefront, it's a software that has been designed by the lead author on this project. The kind of it's really optimized for this type of really standards aligned, interview based and written based um, assessment form. Um, but we do see a variety of districts using a variety of things from spreadsheets to um, paper to different systems that they're being very creative with. So um, a different solution. So 
All right. Keep your questions coming if you'd like. Um, but in the meantime, I'll just put a couple little things here about continuing, continuing your learning. And we've talked about a lot of learning today. So um, if you're interested in uh, professional development opportunities, professional learning opportunities that we can provide for you, obviously, I love I love teaching this stuff. I love working with teachers, working with this stuff. Um, look at uh, Forefront Education. We have um, there's a link at the top that says learning. You will find that, or you could follow this link that says training. Um, also, contact us. Um, we can you can find us at sales at forefront.education. Um, welcome to reach out to that, and that will get to us, um, even if it's not about sales. If you just have a question about the screeners, feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to answer any questions. Um, and then, if you'd like to find out more about our data solutions, um, we would be happy to, to to share that information with you, of course. Um, so uh, check out Forefront.Education as um, the main website for that. I'm sure that many of you have already found that, but um, love to talk with you about the project and love to talk with you about um, how we can support you in your implementation of these screeners and, um, and how we can support your teachers and your students in the process as well. <laughs> Thanks, Kyle. Uh, Kyle uh, Kaufman referring to the NCTM. If you're not a member of the NCTM, I love to plug that National Council for Teachers Mathematics. It is an excellent community. Please join us. Um, it's a really great stuff. So thank you to everyone who joined us here today. Um, and uh, we really appreciate your thinking about um, and supporting your students. Um, we are we exist because you guys are doing the work and um, we're here to support you. So thank you very, very much for um, joining us here today. Tamara, any, any last comments for the good of the whole? No, I, I did just drop this in the chat just to say thank you everyone for sharing an hour of your time with us today and, and look out for an email with that recording link in the slides uh, a little later today. All right, all right. Well then everyone, thank you. Um, and uh, until next time. <laughs>